welcome to the FCBCD. We're so glad you're here joining us on Sunday. If you, this is your first time, please fill out the contact form below. If you would like to join us on this uh, community group on Zoom, please also fill out the form in the description box below. We want to invite you to fill out the new care survey. The survey is to check in to see how you've been doing spiritually and to get feedback on our ministry. Our goal is to improve communication between members and ministry leaders. Click on the link in the description box below and your feedback will be kept confidential. We hope you have a wonderful week ahead. Hey, good morning FCBC Dallas. It's awesome to be able to worship together as a church family. Um, happy Thanksgiving and as is typical for most Americans, we rush immediately into Christmas after Thanksgiving. But um, in all seriousness, uh, today is the first day of Advent, and these are the four weeks leading up to Christmas. And it's an important tradition that's been uh, passed down for generations. They've been expressed in different ways. It used to be a season of fasting, but the church kind of went back on that and said, never mind. And different traditions like Presbyterians and uh, different, different congregations and denominations have done it very different ways. But the point of Advent is to reflect on Christmas when Jesus came the first time, but it's really about when he's gonna come back again and when he's gonna judge the earth and when the world will be made new and Jesus is gonna be king again. Um, so it's a pretty, it's a very uh, simple but profound practice that we do as believers to remember what he did, that it was a miracle, right? Like as we're anticipating, we're kind of walking through the feeling of anticipation of Jesus arriving to earth um, the first time and reflecting on what happened. But ultimately, it's to help prepare our hearts to anticipate and to hope for and to long for Jesus to return uh, again. And that's where our hope is. That's where our future hope is. So as we start this first day of Advent, uh, we're going to sing O Come Emmanuel. Um, and it's about the sense of longing that we have for a Savior, that we have for Emmanuel. And the word Emmanuel means God with us. Let's just remember um, to make it a point to to meditate on, to remind each other, and to really consider deeply what it means for us to anticipate Jesus. What does it mean for us to really see him and to believe in him and to trust in him and to hope in him and to long for him as Emmanuel, God with us. The deepest desire of every person is to know that God is with them. And that is the promise and the hope of Christmas, but the hope fully realized, the promise fully fulfilled is gonna be when Jesus comes back. And so as we kick off Advent, uh, let's sing together and let's reflect on some scripture together as we prepare our hearts and our minds for uh, Christmas and this Advent season. In Isaiah 9, it says, people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness 
from this time forth and forevermore. Church is a blessing to worship with you this morning. My name is Pastor Dylan, and I'm the college and career pastor here at FCBC Dallas. If you're joining us for the first time, or maybe the first time in a long time, I just want to say welcome. I'm so glad you're able to join us in those through this online format. I just hope everyone just had a week that was worthy of giving thanks for. It was appropriate for the holiday we just observed. And just this morning, before we get into our message, let's pray to ask God to prepare us to receive His Word. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this morning that we can come and worship you together. 
We long for the day when we can join in person safely to worship you. But in the meantime, we remember that nothing can separate us from you or your people because we're all united by your spirit. We ask that you be with us this morning as we read from your word. May you speak your truth to us and help us to receive it so that we would be transformed and that we would go into the world to bear the image of your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A question to start off our morning today. Have you ever experienced a wake-up call? I'm not talking about the type of wake-up call when someone calls you literally on the phone just to make sure you're awake. I'm talking about the experience of having your eyes opened to see your life in a way that you hadn't seen it before. The emotional, maybe even psychological experience of seeing your life in a new way because of some experience or something that um, is going on. I had that kind of experience when I first moved to Texas. For those of you that don't know, I'm actually originally from Utah. I was born and raised in a small town in Utah. And it wasn't the smallest town, but it's definitely pretty small because it is the type of place where I actually knew multiple neighbors that wouldn't lock their front door um, just because it was just that safe. And people could walk in and say hi. It's just kind of everyone knew each other. So yeah, like a pretty small town, especially by our standards here in Texas. And as small towns go, education just wasn't a top priority where I grew up. Right. Most people went to work in a local coal mine or for the phone company anyway, so like, why focus on school? That was the kind of environment that I grew up in, like elementary school, middle school, all those kind of years. And while even though, of course, I have my Asian roots, I know school was important, everything, all that, um, but when nobody really around you emphasizes school, it's hard to prior- prioritize it for yourself. Well then, in high school, I moved to good old Plano, Texas. And let me tell you, that was a loud wake-up call when it came to academics. I remember when I was transferring um, to Texas, I asked my school for a transcript because that's what I needed. And when I asked for the transcript, actually I learned two things that I didn't even know before as a student. One, that GPA was a real thing. And then more than that, the school actually used the GPA to rank the students in the school. Now, when I lived in Utah, I had no idea that school rankings were even a thing. Um, But when I moved to Plano, I remember getting my first report card and my GPA was listed out to like the 10th decimal point. I was so shocked. And I was just remembering back when I was in Utah, I was just so blissfully unaware um, that school like mattered so much and that there are all these different measurements and that people cared that much about school. And while my high school self probably would have preferred to just keep living in that blissful ignorance, not knowing what GPA was, school rankings, all that competitiveness in school. I'll be honest, moving here opened my eyes. It kind of pushed me to be a better student. Right, it's kind of a bit of a sink or swim situation, like kind of just throw you in the deep end of luck. But at the same time, looking back now, I begrudgingly admit that I'm better for it in terms of school. Sometimes we just don't know what we don't know. Right? We get stuck in our ways and we can't see the world around us with true clarity. It's kind of like if we're using glasses with the wrong prescription. We can't really see clearly. But once we're given the eyes to see, then we can realize how far off the mark we really are. More often than not, I think that's exactly what happens when it comes to our faith. How many times in your life did you think you had God all figured out? You knew how to read the Bible. You knew how to pray. You knew how to do the whole church thing. But then God comes in with that wake-up call that sets you straight. That could be through a conversation with a friend, a mentor, some major life change, some message you heard, right? This is where God uses his word or his people just to cut straight to your heart, to open your eyes to see. I think sometimes we need a wake-up call in our faith. We need God to be real with us and to speak the truth so that we can see things clearly and ultimately so we can grow. Unfortunately, nowadays, I think we've stopped receiving truth, especially in our faith. So today I'm going to say that today might be one of those times uh, where we hear something that isn't really easy to hear, but something that we need from the Word of God. It's something we don't want to hear, but something we need to hear. So today we're going to be going, today we're going to be talking about our Christian wake-up call, or just our wake-up call. I'll be honest with you, the message today is going to start kind of bleak, kind of negative. But if you stick with me until the end, it'll all come together and we, it will make sense. We'll see the whole picture together. So if you're sitting there thinking you don't need a wake-up call this morning in your faith, 
you might actually be the very one that this message is meant for. So our wake-up call from God this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 20. Isaiah 1, 1 to 20, where in our passage today, we're going to see two points and an application. So I'm going to read the passage in its entirety. It's kind of long, so follow along on screen or in your own Bibles. Isaiah 1, 1 to 20. This is the word of the Lord. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear me, you heavens. Listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, for they had rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its own manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Woe to the sinful nation! a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord, they have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with olive oil. Your country is desolate, your cities burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. Daughter Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom, we would have been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? Have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Sometimes a passage in the Bible is so strong, so direct, that it really speaks for itself without much discussion. In this passage, God is giving Judah a really harsh wake-up call through his prophet Isaiah. God brings his long list of accusations against his people, talking about how they have turned away from him. Maybe a helpful way to think about this is kind of like God is making this court case. There's accusations, there's evidence presented, in order to make an ultimate argument against Judah. A number of the Old Testament prophets actually structure their messages in this way, and so they're kind of like arguing a case in the courtroom. So let's run through the argument to see the case that God is building through Isaiah. So he starts in verse 2 by illustrating the relationship between God and humanity. We are his children. God created us and he cares for us, right? He has revealed himself as our heavenly father. He has raised us to be his own, yet his children have rebelled against their parents. Those of you that are parents might be familiar with this experience. Those of you that were rebellious children might be familiar with the other side of this experience. God has raised his children, yet they have turned against him. I think that we often take for granted the relational aspect of our faith, that God is our father and we are his children. We say it over and over again, so much so that the weight and significance of that relationship just kind of lost its meaning. God is reminding us that he cares about us and that it grieves him when 
His children want to break the relationship that they have with each other. Continuing in verse 3, he kind of shifts to less intimate illustration of the relationship. He contrasts God's people with, with farm animals, an ox and a donkey, right? And if you don't know, these aren't really that smart of animals, but they're at least smart enough to recognize who their leader is, who their master is, right? So the accusation against Israel here is that they don't know. They don't recognize God as their master any longer. Don't miss the connotation here that these dumb farm animals, they're smarter than the people in Israel, right? This is the epitome of misguided self-reliance, forgetting who feeds you, forgetting who your master is. Like a child running away from home thinking that they don't need their parents anymore, not understanding all of the things that their parents have provided for them. And they can't even comprehend that. So these people that have turned their backs on God. This is how God's people treat their Lord, the Holy One of Israel, which begs the question, how do we treat him today? As we read this passage, and really the entire Bible, we can't remove ourselves from the pattern of behavior that we see here. This is as much for us as it was for the people in the original audience. So the strong imagery, this continues in verses 5 and 6. It depicts this beaten body, wounded and uncared for. This is the state of Israel after they rebelled against God. They've gone against God and they reap the consequences. And the question of verse 5, it rings really loudly. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? You can feel the emotion that Isaiah is exhibiting here. He's crying out, like, why do you keep on doing this? When we abandon our relationship with God, the consequences run both ways. You might not be able to see it, but we're hurt by it too. It's obvious to Isaiah here in this passage, but oftentimes it's not so obvious to the ones going through it. Sometimes it takes an outside perspective to help us see the full truth. And then he continues to an image of a war-torn country, totally ravaged after battle. Uh, zooming out um, from the image of the individual that's kind of wounded and beaten, he zooms out to a country with cities on fire that's being pillaged by invaders. In verse 8, he, calls, he uses the reference, daughter Zion. This is pretty important because this is actually a theological reference. Zion is the most holy place in Judah. It's the mountain where they have the temple of God. It's where they built the temple. And in the Old Testament perspective, it's actually where God's holy presence dwelled on earth was in Zion. And the picture here is that Israelites, they left Zion uncared for. They left it vulnerable, open to be overtaken by Israel's enemies. This is the nail in the coffin and their accusations against turning against God. The temple of God is neglected by his own people. This accusation is really heavy. It's kind of like if you told us as Americans that because of our ignorance and neglect, our White House is about to be run over by the nation's enemies. Right? Our symbol of power, hope, unity as a people is at risk of being lost due to negligence. That's kind of what God is telling his people. So God, he's not holding back in his accusations here. This is why this is a wake-up call to them. If we continue in verse 9, we finally see something somewhat positive, um, but it's really praising God and really just another blow to Israel. It says, Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom, we would have been like Gomorrah. It's only because of God's mercy that any of them are even still alive and remain in Judah. If left to their own devices, they would just led themselves to total destruction. Not only that, Israel is compared to Sodom and Gomorrah. If you're familiar with the book of Genesis, you know that this is something you don't want to be compared to. Because God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19 because of how wicked they were. These cities, they're extremely wicked, and God came in and destroyed them. So Isaiah is not only telling Israel that, you know, they've fallen into wickedness. He's telling them that they've gone way past the deep end. This is the hard truth. And for the original audience, it's probably really difficult to accept and hear this harsh word. But without it, it seems like they would have just continued on the path to destruction. And as Christians, do we seek the hard truth? to help one another, right? to help us grow? On the flip side, are we willing to receive this truth spoken in love? More often than not, I think we avoid those kinds of conversations just because we think they're, hot, they're, they're hard conversations, they're awkward conversations, when in reality, uh, we're just kind of afraid of hurting someone's feelings. 
Like, we'd rather focus on God as loving and the positive family relationships, but we forget that God also has righteous anger. If you read the Old Testament, you'll see that God doesn't hold back because his people need to hear it. And today we need to hear it too. So this brings us to our first point today, which is a hard truth. We have a neglected faith. The message that Isaiah brings forward here isn't just for Israel, it's for us too. As Christians in America, we've grown comfortable in our wealth, our prosperity, to the point that when we turn to God, if we ever turn to God, he's been diminished to this like prayer pen pal that we just say hi to once a month or something. Our gaze has shifted away from God in heaven down to ourselves on earth. We replace God on the throne with our own comfort and ease. When we gather, you know, we talk about work, we talk about family, buying houses, the stock market. I don't know. We just talk about anything and everything. But how often are we talking about our relationship with God? How often are we being real with just how we're doing spiritually? How often do we talk about our church and how well we're serving and loving our city? We've diminished the significance of our faith through neglecting our faith and taking our eyes off of God's throne. So let's keep reading. The focus shifts from Israel's rebellion to talking about their religious practice and worship. Because after all, they're still a religious nation. So it starts in verse 10, uh, where he explicitly calls Sodom and Gomorrah like Israel. He explicitly calls Israel Sodom and Gomorrah. And just in case the comparison in verse 9 wasn't clear enough, there's no longer a comparison, but he's equating them now. And the focus on these verses is in the attitude with which they approach their worship. In verse 11, it says, The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me? Says the Lord. He says, I have more than enough burnt offerings. So this kind of gets to the fundamental misunderstanding of worship. right? When we approach worship, I think sometimes we think that somehow... We are offering something to God that he doesn't already have. There's a subtle shift that occurs that can be easy to miss. And that's what makes it so dangerous. Because on the surface, these sacrifices, they're still being made, right? These people are still going to the temple, it seems. They're still making the sacrifices, all of that. Everything looks the way it should look. We have to remember that God sees the heart. Because, you know, through these sacrifices, the people think they're actually doing something for God. They're helping him. But he makes it clear he has, no, he has no pleasure in these sacrifices themselves. His desire isn't for sacrifice. His desire is for his people. This is what Paul is getting at in Romans 12 when he urges people to offer their bodies as a living sacrifice. God isn't caught up in the motions of worship and religion because those are just symbolic of deeper truths. The deeper truth is one of a reconciled and restored relationship with our Creator. Yet, how easy is it for us to become preoccupied with the act of worship and lose sight of the one we worship? As a leader in the church, I'm guilty of this as the next person, right? Spending my time thinking about how to deliver a great sermon, sing that great worship song. Um, Yet what we do in worship services, that's supposed to point us to God. We get it twisted when we start focusing just like on the quality of our service because that's a thinly veiled way to really just focus on ourselves and our own performance. My hope for us as a church is that we would be wholeheartedly given to God in our worship. Yes, we still pursue quality, but not for our own sake, but to God's glory. The measure of our worship isn't in whether or not you and I liked it, but in if God was glorified through our giving of that worship, right? Our giving of the worship to the only one worthy of worship. I've shared this Francis Chan quote before, and we can't ever forget it, right? He has this thing that he says, it's like, when people say that I didn't like worship worship today, he responds, so what? We weren't worshiping you. We weren't worshiping you. So church, let's not ever get our worship twisted and start worshiping ourselves through vaguely religious actions, right? Instead, let's look not only to the visible acts of worship, but look deeper to the substance of it. Does our worship draw us closer to God? Does it share his truth with his people, even when that truth is hard to hear? Because if we simply just keep going through the motions of Christianity, we lose sight of Jesus, and we're just wasting our time. Verse 14, it says, Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. 
I don't know about you, but that kind of hurts to read. That my celebrations would be a burden to God. Like, I don't really want to hear or read that. Uh, but this brings us to our second point for today, which is that we've settled for empty worship. We've settled for empty worship. The danger that we face now is that this can appear really pious, right? We could have that reputation for being that great Christian guy or girl, yet we know ourselves and we know our hearts. This is why God is giving us his wake-up call to open our eyes and see the reality of our worship. And just to quickly clarify, God, he, God doesn't want to hide his face from his people in verse 15. He wants to be among his people in that restored relationship with them. Yet sin separates humanity from God. Later in Isaiah 59, the prophet says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So then it, it would diminish God's glory for him to receive this worship and these prayers as if everything was right between God and his people. God is consistent in his actions. And if he acts in the midst of our blatant sin, then he would be doing a disservice to himself and to us. This is a stark call to self-reflection on the position of our hearts and the substance of our worship. So we have a neglected faith and we settled for empty worship. I know this message is so depressing so far, right? But listen, listen up, listen up. Fortunately for us, God doesn't just call us out and leave us hanging. God doesn't just call us out just to shame us because shame isn't the point. That would kind of make God just really petty if that was the goal. No, our God, he's one that seeks restoration and reconciliation. Our God makes a way back to him for his people. God gives us a choice to make. So we can keep reading in verse 16 when it says, Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. I find it pretty interesting that this passage it pivoted from rebellion and empty worship, and it pivoted toward doing right and serving others. We've gone from accusations about worship to exhortation to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed. Maybe, just maybe then, faith lived out is less about what we do on a Sunday morning and more about how we live every day outside of the church walls. The accusation is for being selfish and inwardly focused. So the right response then is to become selfless and outwardly focused. Perhaps the response of the people and some of our responses even today to the preceding accusations, it was like, yeah, but I worship, I offer my sacrifices, I do my tithes, I do this, I serve in this ministry at the church, etc. I'm this great Christian person. God is saying, you're missing the point. If you aren't helping to create the world that God intended, then you aren't doing right. And in order to make an internal impact in the world, we have to serve and be present in the world not just in our Christian circles, not just in our church at FCBC Dallas. This exhortation of these verses isn't to do these things in the temple back then or just in the church today. The point here is that proper faith and worship is inextricably tied to how we serve and love others. If we are trying to justify ourselves through how often we read the Bible, go to church, community group, all those kinds of things, then we're already setting ourselves up for failure. God, in this passage, he's trying to redefine what proper faith and worship is. And what it is, is bringing about the world that he intended. Not building a new building, not having the best insights at Bible study to share, um, but doing right and bringing God's justice to an unjust world. This is the faith that God is calling us to. So the question for us we have to ask ourselves is, how does our faith lead us to action? Or does it lead us to action at all? Finally, we've reached the end of the passage in verses 18 to 20, where hope enters in. Let's read what it says. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is God's offer of restoration. This is the gospel. This is God's intervention into the situation because he's been making this case against his sinful people. 
left to their own devices, are on the way to destruction, like I've said. Even with the temple, their status as God's chosen people, this is still where they stand. This case that God is building is actually not really to have a debate to argue whether or not Judah has sinned. It isn't even to, re- to reevaluate how legit their worship is or to examine how well they've cared for the marginalized in their society. Verses 1 to 15, those accusations are given as a fact. It's a reality that they have neglected faith. It's a reality that they've settled for empty worship. There's nothing to argue there, actually, in reality. But God makes an offer of grace through forgiveness. And that results in a restored relationship between his people and their God, the Holy One of Israel. Only if, and it's, it's a big if, only if they're willing to change. The imagery of sins, red as scarlet becoming white as snow, red as crimson becoming like wool, God depicts a permanent washing away of their sins. Not merely just a temporary band-aid cover-up, like this is something that is permanent and forever. This isn't something that they can accomplish on their own, which makes the reality of God's love in the midst of their rebellion so unbelievable. See, at the beginning of this, I kind of framed this passage as a court case, and I'll admit that that was slightly misleading, because God, he isn't arguing a case here. He's making an offer to people who are already guilty of everything. So this brings us to our application this morning, which is foster a willing obedience to God. Foster a willing obedience to God. Verse 19 says, if you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. The play on words here is that we can eat or be eaten. We can partake in the blessings or be overtaken by punishment. God makes an offer here. He states the requirement and he shows the consequence if you don't follow through. His offer is a restored relationship with him. The requirement is willingness and obedience to God. And the the consequence of not following through is destruction. So are you going to respond with willing obedience, no matter what that might look like in your life? God, in this wake-up call, he might be calling you to reprioritize some things in your life. The, The way you think and treat your career, your friends, your family, maybe even just the way you think about yourself. Reordering your life to align with God's intention. And this reordering, it's not quick, it's not easy. Yet God's promise is that he's going to be leading us through it, and at the end, it will be worth it. The only ask of us is willing obedience to him. Sometimes it takes a wake-up call to see things for what they really are. And it takes a willingness to receive that truth. But have faith, because God ultimately, he desires his good for us. And we can trust in that. So even with this harsh wake-up call, we know that not everyone followed God's word. Not everyone turned back. We can read that through the rest of the Bible. We can even see it just in our own lives today, right? We can hear this and not respond. So we know that even to pursue willing obedience, we may fail, which is pretty depressing, to be honest. But God didn't leave us in our human inability. Instead, he made a way for us through his son, Jesus Christ, so that through Jesus, we can be made righteous before God. Through Jesus, we are forgiven. Through Jesus, though our sins were like scarlet, they are made white as snow. Though they were red as crimson, they are like wool. What the prophet Isaiah merely prophesied about in the Old Testament, Jesus has already accomplished. What those in the Old Testament didn't even know or see, they only had the promise from God. What they didn't have is the privilege of knowing what we know today to be true. We've seen the other side of God's promises, which is his faithfulness. Jesus has come, he bore our sins on the cross, and he has risen again. The offer to a restored relationship with God is real. It's finished. Yet still, we turn away. Yet still, we fall into the same patterns of sin and rebellion. Brothers and sisters, run to God and accept this offer to a restored faith. Leap into his embrace because God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The work is done. Redemption is won. Not through us, but through what Jesus has already done on the cross. Now, for our part, we have to submit to God and his leading for us. Let's not forget God's faithfulness in the face of our own unfaithfulness. 
Let's run to our Heavenly Father. Let's heed his wake-up call for us and respond with willing obedience. I want us as FCBC Dallas here today, November 2020, to take this wake-up call seriously. So what I want us to do individually today or this week, schedule a time to reflect and sit with God and his message here that he gave to us in Isaiah. Reread the passage and ask God to speak to you how he wants you to wake up and see what's been neglected. Then sit in the depth of his grace and forgiveness through the good news of Jesus. After you've reflected, ask how God wants you to respond to this word. And together, as a church, we can join him in the work that he is doing in the world around us. So let's review what we've covered today. Firstly, we have a neglected faith. Second, we have settled for empty worship. And finally, the decision that we have to make is to foster a willing obedience to God. So the only question left is, how will you respond to God's wake-up call? So now we're going to take a moment and just reflect on the message today. I want us to take time just to think over it, maybe even just schedule that time for your extended reflection today or even this week. Uh, we'll just take a minute and then um, I'll close us in prayer. Father, we come before you this morning, having heard from your word, would you help us to listen to your wake-up call and to take it seriously as a church and as individual believers? Would you help us to respond with willing obedience? Just open our eyes to the ways um, that we've been blind to our faith, God, and our worship of you. Give us the humility to accept these hard truths and just the diligence, willingness, obedience to respond in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.